I'll tell you something interesting about coffee. It's like, you know, in the olden days, like medieval times, like all they used to drink was ale, like yeah. alcohol, yeah. and it really like suppressed their productivity until they, they discovered coffee, like this new drink that they could drink that you know, activated their brain instead of put them to sleep. So that's yeah. what, you know, the renaissance that happened and like everyone getting all productive and all the science, you know, science coffee. has got. Coffee's better than tea is what you're saying. what coffee did for us. Like, no. <laughs> is that what I just said? <laughs> Thanks for putting words in my mouth. Anyway, gaming news roundup. So early access games, they are a dime a dozen these days. But one such title that's really taken the gaming community by storm is Player Unknown's Battlegrounds. This game has amazed a massive impact since it was released into early access back in March. For anyone unfamiliar with it, it's a daisy look-alike with a battle royale rule set that drops 100 players into a single map and pushes everyone closer and closer together over time. It's been incredibly popular on the PC with an average daily peak of some 88,000 players and it's reached over 2 million copies in sales in just over a month. But why the hell is it so successful? Okay, so you're a big fan of this, you've been playing a lot with the patrons and stuff haven't you? Like, why, why are you playing it so much? So we've got this Discord channel now for all you awesome people who want to check us out on Patreon. Um, yeah, I've been playing a lot with those guys on there. It's been awesome to meet some of the, the subscribers, by the way. It's a really fun multiplayer game. Um, I wouldn't advise anybody who wants to play it single player to jump in because it's not at that fit state. And it's quite expensive as well, like £26 for a game. Early in early access is a bit extreme, but if you've got a group of friends to play with and you enjoy the first person, it's actually a third person, but you can go like Iron Sights as well, right. which I loved yeah. about Growth Recon Wildlands. Yeah, that's a nice. Um, touch, if you like that kind of um, <clears throat> military a shooter, kind of almost realistic, but it's it's not too realistic, it's not like an armor. Mm. It's not like proper realistic where you've got to like train for like two weeks before you can jump in and have a game. It's really easy to yeah. pick up and play. The learning curve is quite shallow. Um, so it's a lot of fun from the offset. And like I said, if you've got a bunch of friends to play with, you can make your own fun in this type of game. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm having unlimited amount of fun. I, I can play it for days. Yeah. Like I really can. Daisy. Daisy. Which, I mean, it looks a hell of a lot like Daisy to me. And that's yeah. kind of, there's a lot of games that look like this to me. But I guess this one is so successful, I, I guess the, the level of polish has got something to do with it. Yeah. And like you said, the fact that there's like 20, 25 minutes or something, you know, possibly a play session, is it make, just sets it apart to like Daisy, where Daisy yeah. was an ordeal. Also, Daisy, you did play it on your own. And I, I did jump into that on your own, and that was part of the reason. Like, you were terrified. You yeah. just felt like a lonely kind of yeah. little goldfish or whatever, and there were sharks swimming everywhere. Yeah. Kind of. So this sounds like a completely different experience. What it does really well is the Battle Royale rule set mm. gives you this sense of tension the whole time. So you, yeah. dr you drop in off the helicopter, and and trying to gather as much shit as you can, knowing all the time that if you don't have got a weapon within the first couple of minutes, someone could walk in on you and shoot you at any point. So there's this like underlying like tension or nervousness that goes on, and you know it's going to climax at some point because there will be a battle at some point, and you will get involved in a firefight, and you will probably die. But there's that you know anticipation, and that's what gives it that like excitement, I guess. Okay, so another early access game news: after spending four years in development, DayZ finally almost reached the beta stage. Yeah, you heard that right. The beta stage. Daisy started life as a cult hit mod for the military sim Armour 2 and was released as a standalone title in early access at the end of 2013. Now, just to give you an idea of how long Daisy has been in development, the original creator Dean Hall has actually left the development team, started his own studio, and began work on a completely different game. Daisy does deserve credit for directly resulting in the emergence of a new genre, and it has been a massive sales success, selling 3 million copies. It's just frankly hilarious that a game like Player Unknown's Battleground swoops in before Daisy even arrives in beta, does a similar thing but does it better, more polished, and turns out to be way more popular. I can't believe how long this game's in, been in development. It feels like an absolute eternity, and I, I don't, can't see the payoff. It's always been a buggy, janky, clunky experience. Armor was Armor 2 was pretty like clunky or whatever, but it did what it did really well. So transporting that to DayZ, where you've got a lot of melee and stuff, really bare, open environments with nothing in them, but then suddenly there's like four or five zombies. I don't know how it's taken them this long <laughs> yeah. to make it into beta stage you know it's it's quite unbelievable really over the period of a couple of years that it's been in alpha yes yeah, yeah it's like it must have had a few different waves of a player base that have come and gone yeah over that and, and exactly. the game hasn't even even realized its full potential yet it's not even in beta yet i mean that sounds just ridiculous to me it's been a advocate of playing early access games in the past yeah. but i mean more and more i find that early access games are not worth investing in unless it's player unknowns battlegrounds <laughs> this is not a sponsored video actually. <laughs>
Elsewhere this week, a leaked product listing on Gamefly has hinted at a possible standalone release of Modern Warfare Remastered. Modern Warfare Remastered was previously sold exclusively as a pack-in bonus with the special legacy edition of Infinite Warfare, which released back in November 2016. There was no other way to buy the game. This seems like a like a home run. Why didn't they do this yeah. in the first place? It seems ridiculous. Yeah, it's it's painfully obvious, and it was I think it was just part of the strategy to just boost sales of Infinite Warfare. Yeah. I reckon they saw it coming. I reckon they saw a dip in sales coming, so this was part of the strategy of trying to, you know, yeah. just keep those sales up, keep the, you know, keep the investors happy. Because if there would have been a huge drop off in COD sales, that would have been much worse yeah. than what they, you know, losing a little bit of sales that they might have got from selling this as a standalone. So this is probably always part of the plan. I reckon they probably yeah. always intended to do this down the line. I don't know. I, I I would have bought Infinite Warfare as a Infinite Warfare. No, Advanced Warfare. No, yeah. Modern. Modern Warfare. <laughs> you know, I'm getting confused. All these so many fucking warfares. Man. I would definitely would have bought Modern Warfare Remastered because I loved that game initially as it was released. I played for hours online competitively in clan matches and everything. But then they packaged it with Infinite Warfare. It's like you can have it, but ha you have to buy our shitty newer version of space fucking battles and shit. Space Power Rangers Warfare. Ah, I don't know. It's just it's just that mindset that makes me think I don't even want it anymore. Like you you guys are arseholes. Like I don't want to give my money Screw to you arseholes. Game. That's the way I think. I don't know why. That, that's probably why I get so angry. Mike, it's because I, I I take it personally. Yeah. That's probably what it is. But you know, screw you, Activision. Just screw you. And in why the hell didn't this happen sooner news, China announced they would pass a new law which would require some game developers to publicize the odds of winning stuff in in-game loot boxes. The law was announced last year, but it came into effect just three days ago, and League of Legends developer Riot were one of the first companies to reveal the odds. They revealed that the Hextech chests offer a 7% chance to unlock a permanent hero, and only a 2% chance of getting a character skin, whereas skin shards, a very common crafting item, have the highest drop rate at 45.13%. This law is part of a concerted effort to make microtransactions more transparent. I can't believe we haven't been talking about this sooner, because with like gambling laws and stuff in the UK at least, they tell you on the back of a, of a scratch card or a lot lottery ticket exactly what the odds are of winning, and they're obviously yeah. really bad. But this is basically gambling. When it's, acknowledge it's the beginning of the acknowledgement. Yeah. That this is gambling. Yeah, it's kind of legitimizing it a little bit. So if you know if this is going to be a model for the future and it needs laws and needs protections, I'm I'm really glad that this has happened because a lot yeah. of kids buy these kind of things, so it could lead to bad stuff or whatever. But this this just seems so obvious that like you need to tell people what the chances are of them winning. Yeah. Because two percent chance of getting a character scene is fucking bad. Yeah. And I wonder how many people are gonna, you know, take notice of this and think, hang on a minute, is it worth getting this if there's yeah. only a two percent chance of getting what I want? It starts allows people to work out like how many they're gonna have to buy before yeah. they're almost guaranteed um, what they want, basically. Young kids or younger kids play this. They're not old enough to gamble, but they're old enough to, to maybe do this. To a kind bit. of gamble. Yeah, to kind of gamble. And, and it initiates that kind of feeling. In, I mean, mm. it's cultivating that inner gambler in them yeah. when, when they're still young. Surely, it's not. it, sh it shouldn't be allowed. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, having never bought a, a loot box in my entire life, yeah. I, I don't know if that's... What I'm going to say the thing, well. though. I, th I think it's younger gamers who tend to gravitate towards them a little bit more because we attach to one game more than just playing every game that comes out because they just don't have the money or whatever to keep buying new yeah. games. So this is one way of injecting life into the same game for a long time. So I reckon they're going to be the ones that need this information and they just haven't got it. Also in the news, Nintendo reckons the Switch can match the sales of the Nintendo Wii. Nintendo president Tatsumi Kimishima told investors in a Q&A recently that the company has plans to meet demand for the console and ultimately make a profit on the hardware. He said Nintendo has greatly increased the amount of Switch units it can manufacture due to the rapid pace of sales for the console and that Nintendo has seen a five times increase in profits. The truth is, we want to raise the installed base of Nintendo Switch up to the same level as the Wii, he said. Of course they do, because they want to sell more yeah. games. Yeah, I think it's good. I mean, it's, it's good that it's, it's selling so well. I think they've got a lot of work to do to keep the momentum going, because if they want to keep this sales level going, they need more games and just sell their Mario Kart 8, you know, the re-release, that's, you know, that's as good a game as any. But they're going to need more. They're going to need yeah. more tiles, I reckon, and pretty soon. All in all, I think the Switch launch has gone really well for yeah, them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, looking back at it now, we're saying a lot of nice things about Nintendo. The only thing is that they don't have enough games. Mm -hmm. but, um, I heard that they charted a, 
a plane just to specifically to ship out Nintendo Switches yeah. because um, they were they produced so many. Yeah, but, uh, if that's not a sign of success, I don't know what is. And finally this week, Italian publisher 505 Games, who you may recognize from certain AA games, seeing as we're all saying that now, like Sniper Elite 3, Rocket League and Payday 2, or even indie titles like Brothers, A Tale of Two Sons and Terraria, they've signed a 20-year deal with AAA game developer Remedy Entertainment. Now, Remedy is probably best known for its work on the Max Payne series, as well as Alan Wake and Quantum Break. The deal is apparently worth 7.75 million euro, which will help fund the development of Remedy's upcoming title, codenamed Project 7. Project 7 is pitched as a cinematic third-person action game set in a new Remedy-created universe. A bit of a departure for Remedy, then. It's planned for release on PC, as well as Sony and Microsoft consoles, which, interestingly enough, was not specified to be the PS4 and Xbox One. That should give you some idea as to how long this game could take to develop. So that's your lot for this week in gaming. If there's anything that caught your eye, um, anything we mentioned or anything else, let us know down in the comments below. We always love to hear from you guys. Hit the like button if you enjoyed the video. Subscribe if you're new around here. There's a video around out here if you want to check out some more of our stuff. And if you're that kind of awesome, we've also got a Patreon now that you can support us on. We'll see you again in the next video. Bye for now.